Welcome to Radnor Memorial Library. My name is Pam Sador. I'd like to thank you all for coming. It's a beautiful evening and we are so pleased to welcome Dr. Ava Frick. Dr. Frick is the author of a new book, Conversations with Animals. From farm girl to pioneering veterinarian, the Dr. Ava Frick story. Dr. Ava has co-authored authored many magazine and newspaper articles, hosted radio shows, and of course, hours of public speaking. She educates and entertains pet owners, horse trainers, veterinarians, and just about anyone interested in helping themselves or their animals. It could be nutrition, herbs, pain management, and animal chiropractic and rehabilitation. And tonight, through the magic of Zoom, Dr. Ava joins us from her home in Arizona. And tonight's topic is get to know Dr. Ava Frick and the virtues that animals teach us. Also, what a fantastic thing that our summer reading club theme, which is pretty much nationally observed at public libraries is tales and tales. And this worked perfectly because tonight Dr. Ava will be telling tales about tales. So hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to save our questions for the chat at the end of Dr. Ava's presentation. Thank you all for coming. Welcome, Dr. Ava. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Pam. So yes, we're going to be telling some tales about myself too through, the, through this biography book. So it's going to be fun. All right. So thank you all for being here. And uh, Conversations with animals. That's a, a topic that's certainly near and dear to me. And when my biographer, Ronald Joseph Kuhl, contacted me about, he was interested in my life and putting a story together, a biography. And I said, okay, Ron, it's not gonna be one of these reality kind of things about everybody's life, unless you're okay to be make it be about the animal's lives. And so he did agree to that. Of course, he's not in a little other stuff here and there. But um, it was great working with him and creating this story that I really wanted to share, not so much about me, but really what we learn by sharing our life with animals from little on, how by observing them, observing how they are and how they interact with each other across species, within species, but also how they try to communicate to us. And then watching other people, how closely do they actually interpret what it is the animal is saying to them became important for me. And that's really what led to my first book, which is called Fitness in Motion. It's therapeutic exercises for horses. It's not in print anymore, but I do have it available on a flash drive, but it's helping horse owners from my chiropractic perspective, helping them to do ground exercises, reading that horse, understanding when their body is telling them it feels good, when their body says it doesn't feel so good, and putting that all together in a program that helps them be a better team. So I'm sure many of you have watched or read other veterinary lives so James Harriet, he was really one of the first ones that came out. That book was probably in the 1970s when he authored his first uh, book, All Creatures Great and Small. And then certainly now one of the most popular is the TV, Dr. Full. So we've lost a lot of the, the reading viewers and they go to the visual viewers. So it's good to bring all this back to reading because it gives you the opportunity to Take it from your own mindset, not just having somebody put it there all the time. You can add into it as you read. So within this biography, then, uh, Ron interjected interviews from different classmates and friends as I grew up, other doctors, business associates, and then there's sections in the book um, from my clients and their perspective of who really was Dr. Ava Frick. And of course, in putting this book together, I divulged some of who was the Dr. Ava Frick. It wasn't the kind of stories you would want out when you were young and growing, but as you get older and you know, you get over 50 and then you get over 60 and you go, eh, 
it don't matter anymore. Let's just make it a life. <laughs> so that's where we're at there. So one of the things that I think is so keen about being with animals is that they actually can help us in learning virtues. They help us to become a better person from little on when you watch how they interact with each other. And certainly uh, on people's phones, you can get different YouTube video things that come across and are sent from friends that show interaction of maybe a gorilla with a kitten or uh, elephants helping save a baby elephant and, and all of these different traits that when as a child and growing up, as you look at that, even as us adults, you know, it touches our heart. And you can still learn how to be a better being on this planet and living together. So I'm going to go through a few of these. Uh, patience is one I think about when I uh, go back to the cat world of a cat sitting very still and quiet, waiting for that mouse to come out from a hole in the barn or between two hay bales. And, and they're sitting there. They're being very, very patient quiet. And some of the other traits that we can learn, one would be this communication, learning to talk. So this little girl had come with her mom, I was working on their polo horses. So you can see her communicating with the one corgi, Kiyoki, and then the other corgi, Gus, sitting there. They're communicating back to her. Their ears are up and they're just sure she's going to give them some of her chicken nuggets. I don't know if that ever happened, but there was communication going on and, and we can learn their communication. Another one that's really funny is watching a cat communicate to a dog and a dog communicate to that cat. You know, the cat is speaking cat language and the dog is speaking dog language. And oftentimes the two of them don't get what the other one is exactly saying, yet the individual believes that the other one should. So there's a learning process that even happens within different species. Confidence and self-esteem is another thing we can learn by being around animals. So this is an area in Southern Illinois. It's in the Shawnee forest, and this is called the gap. You can see it's a very small gap when you're on a horse, especially if it's a white horse. So I'm going through there with my knees crushed against his sides as we're trying to not knock them on the, the rock wall. But Dalton decides he's going to get up on his horse. So a young boy learning because of an experience with a horse to be confident and gaining self-esteem. And how far can you push the limits of your life? And how well does an animal accept what it is that you're doing? And, you know, this guy was totally okay with Dalton being a trickster on the horse. Maybe one of the best things is the laughter they can bring us. So you've got the little pug dog, you know, looking at something in there in his Halloween. I'm sure there were treats down inside of there. Or the horse <laughs> playing with the water hose. Um, but they do, there's all kinds of, they run around through the house after they've had a bath and they make us laugh. Or uh, one's playing with be between themselves and running and jumping or even things in the wild. There's just all kinds of ways that they enlighten our lives by helping us laugh. Another virtue is responsibility that it gives the young people. And of course, if you have very many of them as an adult, you still have a lot of responsibility. And there may be times where you're thinking, oh, I can do without a little bit of this. But at any rate, they're a lot of fun. And uh, it gives the kids a, a value in life value for themselves and then they learn that responsibility of taking care of another individual so whether it's feeding the pot-bellied pigs or cleaning up after them or even uh, on that Arabian pony the one boy having the responsibility for his friend being on the back of him wherever he went whatever he did it wasn't just his choice it was also what's happening with the other individual so learning responsibility by being with animals and then there's tolerance or what might be sibling rivalry. You can imagine this litter of kittens and somebody wanting that top position there next to that sauna 
and how for a moment there they've they've got it worked out and then in a split second somebody moves and then there's a big scramble and they're all changing places but learning tolerance for one another and saying okay you can have it today and i'll take it another day so these virtues are very key but really how does the conversation start so how do you start a conversation with another animal another being a sentient being First is understanding the difference between the predator or the prey. So are they the one that hunts down? Are they the one that gets hunted? So the dog is certainly going to be a predator species. The, ver the birds, uh, some of them, you know, they can go both ways. Cats actually are gonna fall into both categories because a cat would be a predator to a mouse or a bird, but a cat could also be prey to coyote, some other species. And then within those, those categories of predator or prey, what are the innate behavioral traits? So a prey individual is gonna be one that tends to want to escape or run away to save its life. So a horse is always looking out for that mountain lion that would jump down on their back and, and their approach to survival is going to be escape pain. Same way with a deer, you know, they're always on guard and they live in this sympathetic, they're, fight or flight state, but yet for those creatures, herbivores like deer or rabbits, they're more comfortable being there than what we as a human are in that sympathetic, fearful kind of state. It's not comfortable for us. They live there as a means of their survival. And so it's a programmed a little bit differently, but still they're going to react to things in that manner. And then they have their own social distancing. I put this in because people have gotten very aware of that, but there are animals that are comfortable. You may have seen a dog sometime when you were out where you wanted to go up to them and say hi because they were cute, but the dog might back up a little bit. There's a certain distance where they're sizing things up. And so they're not quite as willing to engage in the same conversation distance that you are. It doesn't mean it wouldn't happen, but just like with a person, you gotta get to know them a little bit. You exchange some ideas, you find out what do you have in common? You let them smell you and decide, oh, they like your smell. Or they may decide they don't like your smell. So you're going to observe their body language. What are their ears doing? Is their nose, the distance that their nostrils are apart, um, whether or not the fur comes up, what the tail's doing, the position of the tail. And from that, I would say, you can't always judge a wagon dog's tail to assume they're friendly. There are some breeds that are a little bit sly and the tail will wag, but that doesn't mean he wants to be your friend. Um, so, and some of this, you know, is learning by experience. So growing up on a farm from little on and being in the barn with the cats, I certainly learned how to avoid being bit. Not that I didn't get bit, but that's how you learn. Being around dogs, cows, where to stand so you don't get kicked. You know, a lot of it's practice. And then as a veterinarian, you know, every time I get bit by a dog, it hasn't happened in a long time. But when I did, it was like, okay, what did I do wrong there that allowed me to get bit? That then I need to change my operating mode so it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. But one of the important things then is when we pull all this together is that we actually grant that individual beingness. We validate them. You know, you let them know they're important. Uh, you appreciate whatever their purpose is. And, and sometimes that validation means you don't go into their space or you're okay to watch them from a distance and you just flow that good energy. You go, you know what? I'm glad you're here. Thank you for letting me see you do that today. Whether it's the little chipmunk that sits up and then they get all frisky or I don't know, a, an eagle out in the field, just sitting there, it's eating a carcass of something that was killed, but just the beauty of it, the flying bird. You know, there we can we can feel better because we can appreciate them. And then there's those times where you get to ask them for a dance. So it's, it's an exchange of that space, being close for a little bit of time, whether or not it's their lifetime or your lifetime or moments that you get to share that connectivity to whatever music, whether it's really playing or playing in your mind or out there in the universe that you get to share that space and exchange something special. Yeah, so you hope that you as the dance partner make the right steps and moves and you don't 
step on their toes or trip them up as you're spinning around the dance floor. So I wanted to, since this is a, a library program, I wanted to take some excerpts from the book. And Pam had told me that there are a lot of horse people in your area. So I'm gonna start with something I wrote. So, so throughout the book, Ron does the, the history, the narrative, the setting up of the scenes um, and pulling in all the parts. And then I wrote the animal stories. So, so this is one that I wrote about, and there's a bit about a lot of different species in here. So I got three different ones I'm gonna share with you. So I'm just gonna read this, kind of like if we were in the library and we were having like a little book signing and then the author reads from the book. So I'm gonna do that. All right. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit of something before I get started here on this part. A couple of weeks ago, I fell asleep in the chair and when I woke up, I went over the sofa and was laying there with the dog. Then I got up and went to bed. The next morning, I'm in the kitchen. I'm looking, I'm going, what is that funny thing on the floor? Well, it ends up, I'd laid my glasses on the end table and the dog found them and chewed up my, my current reading glasses. So my, my reading glasses from the time prior, well, they'd fallen out of my pocket last summer when I was gardening, got run over by the lawnmower. So I'm wearing two glasses ago which is actually about five years or so back. So at any rate, there may be some extra pauses in here, Ron, if I'm making sure I have the right word. All right, so here we go. There is something about a horse unique to itself. Little girls dream of them. For centuries, they have plowed our fields, pulled our wagons, carried couples to the altar, tended to kids, taken us away from danger, and gotten us back home. Horses have brought the bodies and souls of the rich and poor and warriors to battle. The sound and rumble of the earth under the impact of thundering hooves leaves a heart speechless, stirring emotion to the inner core of both horsemen and horsewomen including those unaware of the connection with their seed. Horses are empowering. They come with speed, grace, exhilaration, yet they are amusing, compassionate, and soulful. Horses speak with their eyes, and their eyes penetrate through our surfaces and reach into the unexplainable depths within us places no other animal touches. During the Great Depression, a simple racehorse, Sea Biscuit, took people a distance away from their strife, gave them purpose, something better to live for. To the struggling workers of America at that time, he represented to the downtrodden and poor the hope that good things would happen after the bad. They always do. And who does not want to root for an underdog? Like most animals, a horse's connection to humans has been fraught with abuse. Yet, century after century, they, like ourselves and other animals, have returned to live among us time and again, forgiving the evils of the past for another chance to fulfill the wants needs and dreams of man. It must be a part of their purpose for existing. For that opportunity to relive times gone by and to be reunited, moving together as life, I am grateful. Still, all has not been a bed of roses or peachy keen when dealing with other spiritual creatures because they have their mind about what they do or do not want to do as well. Horses, for the most part, are large and strong. Their instincts are their inner truth, and they, unlike humans, always listen and obey. Horses, mules, and donkeys do not get into quibbling about right and wrong the way we humans do. Should I or should I not? 
what will others say? With them, it is all about pure survival, how to avoid pain, escape a mountain lion jumping down from above on top of them, or that flight or fight mechanism that kicks in when a person gets on their back for the first time. With horses, it's get the hell out of there or find a better place to be and stick with the herd. That mindset challenges the horse who is in constant discomfort and is suddenly impinged upon by a saddle and rider. Some do their best to ignore it and go on. Some send gentle signals, at first laying ears back, turning to frown as the saddle is cinched, or squishing the tail when asked to do a particular uncomfortable maneuver. Or crow hopping, a style of bucking where a horse arches its back and takes short, stiff hops, hooves coming off the ground. When the rider fails to notice the subtle hints in calm conversation, a horse will resort to bucking. And any person who has ridden very much knows where that can land us. Compare that to a discussion escalated to collaring. Even the most caring and in-communication equestrian owner or trainer has at times fallen guilty to this omission and only awareness of the early signs avoids the catastrophes. All righty, so that'll get you set a little bit about some of what's included in the book. Beautiful. Thank you. So now I've got a little bit of a lighthearted story. This one, because I thought there probably were some llama farms up in Pennsylvania too. So I'll just give you a little backdrop of this and, and Ron sets the scene. But basically when I was back in Missouri, one of my clients across the Missouri River in a town called Augusta, it's a old German area and they have a lot of vineyards. It was a very old farm. It's like, you know, like built at the turn of the 1900s, so 1910s, 20s, 30s, very old barns there. But my client had a farm of llamas. And so periodically I'd get called to go over there and, and work on some of them. So this particular time, it was a, a summer day and uh, my husband, Tony and I, we had a barbecue scheduled for the afternoon. This was a Saturday, but I thought, ah, eh, no big deal. I can get out there, get these llamas done and then I'll have that off my to-do list. And she was off of work too, so that made it nice. So we get these guys handled and then I'd be back to Union and we'd go to our barbecue. So that's the setup for this story. And so now I've driven over to Augusta and we're gonna get started. Upon my arrival, the herd owner already had sorted them. A good and a bad thing. Good for me, less waiting. Bad because this was not a regular routine and the llamas were on edge. SOP, standard operating procedure, when working with llamas is never, and I repeat, never look one in the eye. The result can be getting spat upon. As we set up to get working on the CRIA, it's the American Spanish for baby llama, they sent out distress calls. So now you have all the, the, the sounds that mm, 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 they get doing their little, their little tones that indicate to everybody that this, this is not kosher, it's not gonna be good. The matriarch began pacing back and forth on the other side of the isolated working pen inside the barn. I was diligent and time efficient with each Priya to minimize everyone's stress. And the farm owner was doing her best to keep the group calm, especially the leader, now focused on the stranger danger present in her midst. About to switch out to Kriya number three, I stood up. So I'm on the ground working on these little guys. And then I stand up to turn just to get set for what I was going to do with the next one. I stood up and turning toward my left, a small, I'm talking minuscule, small, 
corner of my right eye, scanned the outer perimeter and caught her eye. That wasn't meant to happen. So Ron adds into here, too late. The female was locked, cocked, loaded and ready to fire. And fire she did. There was no ducking. Frick was hit. Not even Wyatt Earp could stave off this indefensible attack. That's me. This was not a simple spit. This was regurgitation. A heave of her entire green, acidic, fetid stomach contents in one lump sum. She had unloaded all over me. My hair, eyelids, shirt, annihilated. And stink, whew. You can't imagine unless you've experienced it firsthand. The stench permeated the barn, the owner and me. All the other llamas instantly knew what had happened. She had retaliated from only five feet away like a water hose turned on full blast. Ouch. Ron finishes this little escapade. The only thing left was the crying. And Frick had no time for that. Wiping off the worst, she got on with finishing the task at hand, drove 45 minutes home with the windows down, yeah, yeah. wearing dirty, stinky clothes. Yeah. At home, she showered, but the smell lingered. The shirt never came clean of the green stain. Isn't it funny, the stuff we remember? It was one of my favorite t-shirts. You know, I thought I was going to be handy and all be, be ready and dressed. And that green stain never came out of that t-shirt. Tony, my husband, laughed as Ava pondered her lesson, concluding aloud, never plan a barbecue and llamas on the same day. To everything, there is a season, a time to laugh, a time to weep. I did some of both that day. All right. <laughs> oh, llamas, you gotta love them, huh? They can be so fun, but oh my goodness. All righty. So the other story, I'm just gonna take a quick drink here. You know, we talk about love, which is a virtue that we can learn from animals. And there's one of the species that seems to have an overabundance of unconditional love. And I do believe that is the dog. And probably the majority of people would agree with that. Well, I, I will honestly say I'm very much a cat person. I like their independence, but that much independence does not coincide with unconditional. You see, there's a bit about the dog nature that pulls in that you know, they don't judge you. You're always okay. You know, no matter if you're gone 10 minutes or 10 hours, you come home, they act the very same. They're always happy to see you. As a friend of mine that was, um, he had a goat and it was a cowboy friend of mine. And he would laugh about, you know, he had, had had been married, but uh, with the goat, he would always laugh about no matter how late it was that he came home, no matter what he smelled like, even if he'd been at the bar, Oreo was always glad to see him and never questioned him, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so, so this story is when I had moved back to Missouri and I had, had built my own clinic in this relatively small rural town because I had already been in Arizona and I knew the benefits of some high tech things. I made sure that within my clinic, I had laboratory equipment where we could draw blood samples and run a blood test that very day. I wasn't wanting to wait three or four days to get the results. So this was new to that area. So, so this one particular day, uh, a farmer comes in with his beagle and I'm just gonna read you that story. An old farmer brought his favorite friend in to see me, a beagle mix. He had been sick for a few weeks and was growing weak. Fortunately, my clinic's laboratory system could run blood tests and get results the same day. As I explained what I was thinking and wanted to do, the farmer constantly stroked her body. Suddenly, 
Fear started rolling down his cheek. He began apologizing that she was just a dog and he didn't know why he was crying. You see, back when he was young, many people on farms grew up with the mindset that the house was for humans and all animals were kept outside. He seemed one from that generation. To him, spending money on a dog was forgiven. Oh, sorry, it was foreign, not to be forgiven. It wasn't something that they did. Was, and they spent money on their livestock, the horses, the cattle, the pigs, but dogs didn't get money spent on them when he was growing up. They either lived or they didn't live. Still, he was thinking with his heart, which would not let him leave her be sick. She had loved him unconditionally, and that love had melted through. In return, he loved her. I assured him that it was good to have a friend that he enjoyed that much and wanted to help. She ended up staying with us for a few days. When she left with her dad, there she was, sitting right next to him in the front seat of his pickup truck and down the road they went. Maybe with a little piece of my heart too. You know, people, when they go into veterinary medicine, so young people, you know, out of college, before college, when you're, you, you tend to think that you're doing this because you love animals. And that's probably true. That you, you think that you're just going to work on animals, that you can avoid the humans, but you can't. The best veterinarians are the ones that take that turn, that corner, and realize that, number one, without the humans, we wouldn't have the animals coming to us, mm -hmm. and that we have to help the humans because they're the ones making the decisions for the animals. Mm -hmm. And so there was that point that happened for me where I realized that I had to be a better human negotiator and a better human communicator and a better human conversator in order for all the animals I was taking care of to be cared for the best because I wanted to be able to help them and to be a better individual, a better doctor, better groundside manners, as they say, working with the owner opened up a whole new realm and created a lot more people that uh, appreciated what I wanted to do and would come to me for that reason because they felt comfortable there too. And that's what's important, that the owner of the animal is comfortable to talk to the doctor about anything, that they're not afraid to bring up a topic or a subject for fear that they're gonna get chastised and that kind of thing. So conversations with animals, is also conversations with the people. And so that's what that book is about. It's about those life learnings. The, the book does come in hardcover, softback, ebook, and pretty soon we're gonna have it in an audio form that people will be able to listen to as well. If you want the book autographed, then you would order it from myself, my site, and I'll autograph it for you. Otherwise, there are uh, Barnes and Nobles and Amazon, and, and you can Google it up and find it in many, many places if you include conversations with animals, Dr. Ava Frick stories, something like that. So I'd like to open it up to any kind of questions that anybody has. Yes. Let's see, what are our options? I, I wonder if we can, um, maybe we can close the presentation, Dr. Ava. Are you I able do to that. do that? Okay. And um, then, um, Let's see here. So I can go out of that. Now we won't have anything in our background. Great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rod. Hi. Hi, Pam. <laughs> can you hear How me? How are now? you? It's good to see everybody. And feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask Dr. Frick a question or, or a comment. I know I thought of so many things. I I just oh, wrote down. Turn it off, Pam. Go ahead. Uh, Fire. No, I just, this just something about, I'm a dog person, okay, dog, it's, I was brought into the world, there was a dog before I was there, so I, I am crazy about dogs, there's something about horses that make me cry, mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, 
but they are huge and they're so beautiful. And when you mentioned abuse and I'm thinking, well, I guess that can happen anywhere. We know that, but they, they've gone through war. They take men to war. Um, and then dressage, dressage makes me cry. They are just such beautiful animals. And I think you're so privileged to work with them. I mean, you do, you're, as a chiropractor, I saw a video of you adjusting a horse. That was scary. <laughs> yeah, there's you must a, feel um, that way about horses. Horses just are stunningly beautiful. Oh. Yeah, people are attracted to them a lot of times and they don't even know why. You know, that's, there's some kind of a link, a bond, an appreciation, whatever it is. I was at, a, there's a horse rescue that gets horses off the racetrack. I was over there yesterday and worked on a couple. And this one's 17 years old and he's had, oh, he's, when you look at him, you can tell he's got lots of problems and they've been trying to bring him back, but he can't put weight on and all these different things. And he's very stiff and sore. So I started just doing my thing, some body work on him and adjusting him. By the time we were done, he was like already a new horse. He's like got bossy and... <laughs> But at one point in time, I was working on him and he turned around and looked at me, you know, like, okay, you're okay to be back there. You're cool. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, they're amazing. I have a question. Okay. Um, you had a picture of a horse and the horse was blindfolded. What was that about? So, oh, that's a, a face mask. So in the summertime when the flies are bad, the flies oh. will go to their eyes and then it makes their eyes water. So it's a mesh net that goes on them so that the flies won't do that. Oh, I never knew that. And they don't mind that? No, actually, it's a whole lot better than having the weepy eyes and the flies. <laughs> they get used to it. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, sure thing. This is Ron. This is Ron Joseph Cool, the biographer. So I'll introduce him to everybody there. <laughs> um, I'm we met Ron. Ron was in the Windsor room at Radnor Library when... Um, when he talked about, we had Ron there talking about Chef Tell, and everybody here in Philly knows Chef Tell. Well, yeah. a great biography. That was a fun time. That was about 10 years ago, Ron, wasn't it? It was, 2013. About 10 years ago? Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed that event. That was good. It was and I know you live event. In, yeah, I know you live in Florida. I do. And you're still in Florida. I'm in Clearwater. Okay, Clear, Clearwater. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, Ava came here to visit, and when I was taking her back to the airport, that's when I got the idea. I said, Ava, do, do, you, uh, do you remember the, the, the animals that made a difference in your life and that you made a difference? She said, oh yeah, I remember them all. And she started listing them off by name and exact, I mean, Ava is incredible. She is a definitely outside the box veterinarian. All right, right. Well, I'm a cat person and I'm not sure I agree with you about that they don't love you unconditionally because I feel that they forgive you. A, a, you know, they forgive you all the time. I have two cats and sometimes, you know, I, I do things they don't like, but they forgive me and they're very affectionate. Oh yeah, they are I definitely. I don't agree with the unconditional love myself. That they okay. don't give unconditional love. Actually, I'm a cat person. I, I could live without a dog. I would never live without a cat. But I think they, I mean, they do forgive you because cats, they're not into holding grudges, that's for sure. They're going to just go on with life and make it all be good. Yeah, I've got one on my lap right now. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> See, I have two Siamese. Oh, my gosh, beautiful. Oh, yeah. Beautiful kitty. Yeah, they're fun. They make life enjoyable i'm looking forward to, i guess you're going to do the talk about nutrition and things like that mm -hmm. that'll yeah. be our next one i really want to hear that one because he has kidney disease oh okay and i you know i like i'd like to hear what you have to say about i you know okay. i mean he's you know he's being treated actually he has a lot of kidney stones he's going tomorrow mm -hmm. to have his blood tested for okay she wants, to, she wants to figure out where the kidney stones are where the where, what's causing the kidney stones, I guess. Oh, I can, I can answer that question for you. I'll make sure, and I'm glad you 
added that comment because I'll make sure and have that in the program. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh huh. He's a very affectionate cat. <laughs> well, yeah, so his he eyes is. are. He's not cross-eyed either. No, he it's Siamese just, seem to be. His Siamese are a little dog-like anyway. Yeah. Know? Yeah, they're very talkative and uh -huh. they're quite characters. Yeah, they are. I've known some of them to fetch. Uh, you know, that, you know, you can his, toss them his brother did that when he was a young. He would, uh -huh. you know, I threw the ball all the yeah. time. Yeah, little. Back. Yeah, they bring it back. But yeah. My other, my other one, which is sitting over there on the table, she's um, he. This guy is fourteen years old, but she's six. But she's after she got neutered, she just became food obsessed. I mean, oh. she, she sits over my shoulder when I'm eating. <laughs> I have to put her in the bedroom when I'm cooking so can, <laughs> because she will get into it. <laughs> it's really bad, really bad. She wants to be a chef too. I don't know. <laughs> I, of course, I don't want her to be too fat. You know? so I right. watch her weight. That's right, yeah. Well, they're kind of like people too. Some eat to live and other ones live to eat. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm a guy. I'm a little bit of both. Sort of both too. Hold on. I guess she can't. Uh, since uh, she sees me eat all the time, she figures she should be eating too. You know. <laughs> Your turn. Her turn. Very good. That was interesting, Doctor Frick, when you talked about um, as a vet. You know, you're working with animals, working with families, parents, pet parents, as we're called mm -hmm. now, um, and wanting to make them feel, well, the animal has feelings, but the pet parent has feelings too. And it just reminded me of one time I, I said to my vet, I said, um, oh, well, it's just a bird. And he said, no, it's not just a bird. And I didn't expect that he would say that, you know, I, and that just, it was just such a wonderful thing to hear my vet say, she's not just a bird, you know, she's blue, she's this, she's that, she's your pet. Uh, and you're so right. Um, for many of us, it's family. They are, they're, they're part of the family. And um, that's how we treat them. We're pet parents and but it's never just a bird or just a dog, like the farmer said, it's mm -hmm. a dog. You know, they, they are just wonderful and they teach us so much. I think children can learn a lot from having pets. Anyone want to weigh in on that or especially you, Dr. Frick? Well, that was part of this is that uh, even if, if the parents read the book or they think about these virtues, that even if they're not going to ha allow the kids to have their own animal, which I think is the best, to get them out into nature, to get them to places where they can interact with them, not just seeing them across a fence or across a glass wall, but where they can touch them and, and be with them closer. Mm -hmm. now, I mean, even there's interesting things like ants are interesting if you think about how, how tenacious they are at doing what they do. There's a lot of things in nature to look at and to appreciate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone else comments, questions? I just love that, that whole concept of the virtues. I never knew anything about that. And uh, Ava was also, when we did some research, we spent a long walk on the Clearwater Beach. And she was telling me about the virtues and how the animals relate to virtues. And she was also telling me about Ayurvedic medicine and Ayurvedic nutritional uh, mm -hmm. things that, that, and types of dogs and the kinds of dogs they are and how they relate to the virtues also. You know, she, I don't know if you want to touch on that at all, Ava, but uh, it still really, and I'm super impressed me. Just never well, thought so, of that. So the Ayurveda is from India and it would be India philosophy in, in regards to uh, wellness. So it includes surgery and includes medicine, includes herbs, it includes the mind, it includes the body, includes all those aspects of trying to bring that individual to the best state it can be. 
And they, they look at simply you know, breaking it down, what are called doshas. And there's vada, pitta, and kapha. And these doshas, you're a, a blend of those three. You're not just one, but you're a blend of, of all three of them. And, and so are animals as well. And so depending on which type you are, like a pitta, the more pitta you have, the more fiery you're going to be. The more, um, well, food aggressive you are, the more uh, uh, wound up you can be, but yet you have a very stable, can eat anything digestive system. A kapha individual is one who is uh, laid back. Uh, they tend to be the best parents. They're most loving and nurturing and caring. They have rounded eyes, um, but they also have problems with weight gain and um, body fluid gain, that kind of thing. And then the vadas, those are the ones that are kind of the free spirit type. They're the more ethereal, the more uh, light air and uh, on the move. They're very creative, uh, but they can also tend to be a little more fearful and have digestive. So, so there's, it's a combination. Everybody, when they're born, has a combination, a percentage of all three of those and how those interact. And then, then the philosophy is, is you want to keep your innate dosha in balance when it goes out of balance is when you have mm -hmm. disease or parasites or things happen emotionally all of that can become uh awry you know you're just it's not all even anymore and so what they do then is work through all of their other different ways of assessing it to bring your dosha back to your balance so it's keeping your balance point with you and not getting shifted out of that. So we can look at the same thing with animals and feeding them different ways, depending on what's happening and even seasonally changing up. And we'll talk more about that whole food concept then on our, our next one in July. But and yeah, Ayurveda is a, a really fun intro uh, in, into ways to observe animals and their personality traits. Um, I have another, um, I don't know, comment or guess question. Okay. Um, you know, I used to watch Jackson Galaxy, you know, the Cat from Hell program. I don't know if you've ever watched him. Uh -uh. No, okay. I'm much of a TV person. Yeah, well, you probably don't have time. Um, <laughs> but but uh, he, he said about cats that they they talk, but they talk to you. They But I don't, I, sometimes I swear they talk to each other. Oh, like gosh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. You know, that they communicate. Yeah. And yes. actually sometimes... Do you think they have a high pitch sound? So like I think sometimes their pitch is higher than I can hear, you know, because they they seem to respond to each other and I, I didn't hear it. You know what I mean? Like I seem to, you know. Well, there's also that aspect of just being a spiritual being and that you can communicate that way. So the cats are very in tune with each other and uh, they certainly could have some other uh, frequency that they communicate to each other on, but it also could just be that one of them's ear flicked or it's tail moved or something that the other one is aware of and then brings them back into communication with each other. Yeah. You know, one, thing, just... one thing that's always surprised me. Go ahead. Hi, John. Yeah, hi. Uh, I don't know if I'm on visual here, am I? Yes, you are. I can That's see the, you. Yeah. One thing that's always surprised me is how uh, species get along so easily. In Pam's backyard, at any given time, you can have rabbits, squirrels. Um, what else do we have, Pam? Um, chickens and crows. Chickens and crows. All at the same. Well, the crows will wait till we leave, but they're up there in the trees waiting for us to leave. Squirrels but the there. chickens and the bunnies and the squirrels just hanging out right there. Yeah, just walking around each other, you know, and, and not caring about each other. Now, also, you know, many times in, in my life, I've had uh, dogs and cats who just curl up with each other and, you know, sleep with each other. And also, uh, there's a place in West Virginia where I go where there's a... Um, our, the cabin that I rent is right across the street from a, um, a meadow where there's a horse. And my dog will 
go over there and put his nose through the uh, fence and the horse slowly comes over and without knowing each other, they're buddies, you know, right away. And it's always is astounding that species, uh, different species can just so quickly get along with each other. And Pam's backyard is just amazing you know, how, how the species just get along with each other. And it's like, you know, they've been best buddies forever. It's all about the food. It's all about the nuts. <laughs> oh, but you know, there's also a sense that it's safe there. Oh, you know, I they know. can sense when oh, it's sure. a good, you got good mojo going on, John. Yeah, because mm -hmm. there's one, um, sometimes I'll, there's two shies that don't come up to us at all, but the other squirrels eat out of our hands. And um, sometimes there'll be one on the grass, but Opie will decide, nah, I'm going to come over and take one out of the bucket and rub your hand. Exactly. That's what they do. So I you got wild do. squirrels that you even named. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, guess, I guess that's it. That, that is safe. They feel a safe. sense of safety there. Yes. And I guess, yeah. you know. <laughs> and even the dog and the horse, they're communicating to each yeah. other. They're having their yeah. conversations. Right. Yeah. yeah. When uh, when my dog went over there, I, my first thought was that that horse who weighs you know a thousand pounds is going to you know is going to kick you and step all over you. But no, my dog jumped through the fence and they sniffed each other and they were fine together. Uh, and you know it just astounded me. Yeah, the animals are more willing to be friends. I think uh, you know, the higher up we've gotten on yeah. the the ladder of life. We, we create our own scene. They're happy to keep their, their life happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, will tell you the, I will tell you the bad part though of my dog making good friends with the, uh, with the horse. My we dog, ate some, my ate dog some decided that he, he liked the, the uh, manure. <laughs> I knew where that one was going. <laughs> he ate the manure and about three o'clock that morning, he woke me up and decided oh. to go outside and, and throw, up, throw up the manure, yes. Yeah, well, when the horse isn't quite as bad the second time as cow, that one's really bad for us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, dogs are herbivores, and so they are actually programmed to eat man herb. I'm uh, sorry, they're omnivores, and omnivores can eat manure. The dogs are programmed to eat herbivore manure to get B vitamins. So okay. horses, rabbit, deer, their yeah. manure has B vitamins in it. And so <laughs> it's kind of like, that you know they're going back to their wild roots when they're doing that they they go i don't know what came over me right. yeah. well, he was, he was there's, there's nothing dog. in the cat litter box though that's that they, yeah, well, they my don't dog, pass my dog was, the cat box yeah, my dog was coming out of both ends <laughs> yeah that was a bad day that, that reminds me of a story from from your life uh ava you talked about uh, the, the dogs <laughs> eating chicken bones on Sunday and then what came after? Yeah, so when I first was out in practice, I worked in a rural clinic in Southern Missouri in the Ozarks. And if you know Sundays in, in the country is after church, you have fried chicken, mashed potatoes, green beans or corn, and that's your mm -hmm. stable on Sundays. And so the people would tend to give the dogs the chicken bones. So Thursday, so now these chicken bones, they're very porous and they absorb moisture. So by Thursday, the dogs are constipated. So we, we inevitably, Thursday became enema day because we would have so many dogs by Thursday coming in because they couldn't poo. <laughs> well, better that than choke to death. Because my parents always said, don't give that to the dog, he'll choke. No. So, yeah. And they that too. Hunter. Did you ever have a dog choke on a chicken? Have you had calls like that? No, no, I didn't have okay. that. Although I have had um, emergencies where a bone, usually it was like a pork bone or steak bone, got caught in the roof of the mouth between the teeth. <sighs> and the dog was so frantic that people couldn't get it out. So, you know, you have the emergency call, sedate them just enough to get them to chill and then take the pliers and pull the thing out of there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, veterinarians are lucky. We have a plethora of stories if you're willing to divulge. <laughs> tales and tales. That's, that's right. Our, that's tales our theme. And, tales. and um, I am in July. 
it, it is July 26th, right, Dr. Ava? Yeah, and last Monday is July. Right, mm -hmm. okay, and you'll be talking with us pet nutrition in the 21st century and reducing the likelihood of chronic disease and cancer. And because um, we know, seems like what affects us also, our dogs, cats, who are living in the same world and mm -hmm. affected by cancer as well. So, so yes. anyone else, should we say good night here? And um, I'm so glad we recorded this. Thanks, Dr. Ava. Ron, wonderful to see you. Uh, nice Ghostwriter, what do you think about <laughs> Ghostwriter? There's gotta be a better name for a co-author, huh? <laughs> Ghostwriter. <laughs> never, never thought of that. I'm just happy working with words. Oh, okay. Well, Carrie, can I help you? Hi, Carrie. Uh, I was. I'm, oh no, my it's, mind, okay, it's my mind was somewhere else. What what day is the next one? Okay, the next one is July 26th. They're all Mondays. Okay. okay? I'm so just that's, putting it on my calendar. So yeah. put it down July 26th at seven o'clock through the magic of Zoom. Zoom. Uh, Dr. Ava will visit with us again. I'm hoping by that time the Radnor Library has your book too. We're, we're waiting to get your book. It'll be delivered soon. So I, so I guess we'll say good night. I want to thank everybody for coming. Dr. Ava, this is wonderful. I thank really you, I enjoyed your stories. You, and Ron, so nice to see you again after nice 10 years. 10 years, huh? Yeah. Well, we're Arizona. And I think we're the locals here, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, good night, so everybody. Nice you all. And Happy. I hope to see you on July 26th, right here on Zoom with Dr. Ava Frick, author of Conversations okay. with Animals. And uh, you can visit Dr. Ava's site, probably Amazon too, all the usual suspects. They're selling Conversations with Animals. And coming soon is the audiobook, right? Yep. On Dr. Ava. Okay, mm -hmm. good. All right. Well, good night, everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is Pam Sador, and thank you for joining us. Radnor Memorial Library uh, in the summer on this beautiful night. <laughs> good night, and I'll see you next time, everybody. <laughs>